Say thank you to Bruce McGregor, the author of Plumas Eureka on Glass, which is a cultural history of the Plumas Eureka mine. We're so grateful that he's here giving a presentation on the Mohawk stamp mill today. So let's do a quick round of applause and welcome. Uh -oh. Better not clap before, clap after. <laughs> you guys have the uh, coolest room in the house today, so I, that's actually why I'm giving the talk, so I can hang out here. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Uh, what we're gonna do is set the stage by talking about the history of the mill for about 30, 40 minutes, kind of bringing us up to the present, and then Alex Neeb is gonna talk about the restoration of the mill, the current events, what's happening now. And she'll kind of wrap up for us and then questions, if you'd like, after that would be great. Um, I think the motivation behind this talk started when I was five years old. We, were camp we camped here when I was five. No state park, just a campground, and this building, of course. And uh, my dad took me camping. Back in the 1930s, his dad took him camping here. Said he fished, they fished. And the, uh, the story that we heard over and over again, we had relatives here. The Sam Whites were living in town, so we had relatives in town. And the story that we kept hearing over and over again was uh, about the mill. Um, if there was any loud noise, it, just let me stop, does everybody know what the mill is, where the mill is. Show of hands. Yeah. Big building up the hill. Doesn't look real solid right now. <laughs> Looks a little. So the story that my dad told and the story that he heard back in the 1930s was that if there was a, any loud noise in the mountains, a sonic boom, thunder, anything, it was the mill collapsing. <laughs> and if you lived around here, you waited for it, you expected it. It was something that was going to happen. And it was uh, kind of like, you know, how you set your watch. Once every hundred years, the mill would, but it only could happen once. State Park came and the story changed. The story began to f be more about the historic value of the mill, how important it was to the park, kind of a centerpiece of the mining history in the whole area. And as the park became part of our culture, became part of us, we sort of adopted that story. We visit the mill, we tell different kinds of stories about it. The park worries a lot about keeping it up, keeping it, trying to keep it here. Uh, some people even will make t-shirts uh, that go with that particular theme. Don't do a thing like that. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. They're crazy, right? But uh, Anyway, a quick turnaround on the t-shirt. Uh, but all these stories kind of add up to the same thing, that somehow saving the Mohawk Mill is important, that it's worth it, and that there's something of value to us in that building. If you've looked at it, if you heard about the winter we just had, if you even, with this group, if you've lived through that winter, you know that the mill uh, had about, um, see in Johnsville, 18 feet, I think. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. But there was, in the parking lot, I think there were about 18 accumulated feet of snow. So that same load sat on the mill. People began to think again about that roof collapsing. Part of it did collapse. The little structure that is on the lower end of the mill collapsed. All those things tell us the same thing, that saving the Mohawk Mill is uh, problematic. It's something that we can't take for granted and that it's something that we have to decide ahead of time is important enough to us to even take into our thinking uh, in a time when we're worrying about a lot of other stuff. Those issues, all those factors, I'd like to kind of roll into this talk with the idea that I'd like you to keep in mind that there's more than one way of saving the Mohawk Mill. One way is millions of dollars, right? I'm the obvious way. Right? I'm sure you probably could make a guess as good as I can about how many millions of bucks it would take to save that structure by completely rebuilding it. 
there are other ways to save it. Let me talk a little bit about the other ways as we work our way through the slides. Okay, Darcy. Thank you. Thank you. We're live at five. Okay, a little quick little test. Laser pointer works. Oop, if I aimed it the right way, it would. Yep. Okay. All right, Darcy, please. Um, what's unique? Mohawk Mill, right dead center. Johnsville, familiar landmarks to everybody. We're uh, we're about. Oh, I could use the laser pointer, couldn't I? We're about right there in the museum building, which was a boarding house connected with the mill. Um, the mining scene, I'm gonna do like the 60 second version of mining on Eureka Peak, 1850, right after the gold rush. Uh, they found a visible outcropping of quartz with gold uh, laced through it. At what's called today, oh good Bruce, how about this way? The discovery site, about right there. Prospectors made it to the top, almost to the top of the mountain, found a quartz outcropping, 40 feet wide, laced with gold, and quickly figured out that that column of quartz disappeared inside the mountain. This wasn't a giveaway. This wasn't Thanksgiving, take all you can get at the top of the mountain. The rest of the quartz gold they'd have to dig for. So from 1850 on, four claims were struck on the mountain, four sets of tunnels, four companies that began to work the 76 mine, the rough and ready on this side of the mountain, uh, the Plumish Eureka claim on this side, and the Mammoth claim on this side. Uh, they worked in summer. They only had five months to work before the snows got so deep that they had to get out. Uh, a winter, winter's a lot like the ones we've just had. Those companies worked from 1850 to 1871. Three of them didn't do very well. They spent either spent all their money digging the tunnels or they ran out of money because there was no gold. Only one of the companies, the Plumish Eureka, not, not to be confused with the modern name, the original Plumish Eureka began to discover really high paying quartz gold at the top where they began to set up a mill, dig the tunnel deeper, and in a mill on Eureka Lake, over on this side of the mountain, begin to process the ore with just 12 stamps in a little mill that let them crush the rock, mix the, the rock with mercury, uh, and retort that off to, to uh, distill out uh, gold, nug gold ingots. So that set the stage for this rule of thumb that Plumish Eureka, the mine, the mountain was mined from the top down. These tunnels began at the top, they got lower as time went on, and the tunnels got longer. They figured out, kind of as we described, that this column of, of gold-bearing ore, they named it the Eureka Chimney, started right there, goes into the mountain, was actually accompanied by other columns of gold. There was the rough and ready, uh, uh, column in, the, in this area, uh, there was the 76 column in this area, and there was the Jameson column down here, waiting for another mine, more like 1890s. But as they discovered these, they also discovered that to get the gold out, they had to go down. And as they went down, the mills that they had situated up high, they, gee, they discovered that the gold had to, the ore had to be hauled back up to process. The lower down they got, the higher up they had to, to, to bring the ore, the more expensive it got. Three of these companies did horribly bad. One company did well. In 1871, the British bought all four of these claims out. The company Sierra Buttes Mining Company consolidated all the claims on the mountain into one big claim took one look at the situation and said, wait a minute, thank you guys, appreciate your effort. We now know where the column of gold is, the load. It's the Eureka chimney. We also know that these little mills up high are not doing a really good job. What we're gonna do is we're going to consolidate all of our operations in one spot, build one mill, which they called the Mammoth, and from that mill, they were going to process all the ore they could lay their hands on from the four original claims. 
That worked out fine for about, let's see, it, it, let me get from 1871 till about 1875. Uh, they were going fast. This mill, the new mill, had 40 stamps compared to the 12 that were in the original mill. They discovered that bigger is better, and they discovered that all the ore between here and here to their mill in the town of Eureka Mills was worked out by about 1871. Guess what? As they went lower in the mountain, they needed another mill lower down, which would mean that they could move the ore down to the mill and not have to bring the ore back up in order to process it again. And hence, in 1875, plans were laid for the Mohawk. That's our baby right there, which would have 40 stamps and be all set to uh, cash in on this load. Okay. Eureka, the town that the company started up uh, on top was called Eureka Mills. It had a boarding house. Uh, it had a tram to bring the ore in from the original tunnels, all four of them. Okay. Okay, Darcy. Uh, and it was so high and, and perched precariously that the 200 miners, 250 miners who lived there had an amazing time in the winter, but they stayed open all winter long. The, the Mammoth Mill ran six days a week, 24 hours a day, producing this gold. That's the Mammoth Mill, end of the ore tram, and the town itself perched precariously, but it's now British, it's efficient, they're on uh, timetables, they're punching the clock, there are 300 miners working there at the peak. It is a huge, enormous operation that was concentrated at this level until the gold began to run out. And they figured out that they had to build a mill farther down. Okay. And that fell to George Woodward. Kind of like to give this guy um, a round of applause because George was the millwright. Uh, yay, George. He, he would be appreciative. <laughs> uh, George um, w built all these mills. He built the Mammoth. He built the predecessor mills. And by the time they figured out that they needed the mill at the bottom, the Mohawk, George was just warming up. He got now got to build the biggest mill, 40 stamps, keep in mind. Uh, and George uh, was more than prepared. He was a draftsman. He had uh, timber hewers working with him. And I'm going to jump to 100 years forward, to 1975. Literally, 100 years after George was tasked with laying out this mill. George's house was in Johnsville. A friend of mine, uh, David Dawn, owned the house. It was falling apart. David restored it. In the attic, David Dawn found 30 mechanical drawings. Horrible condition. All, uh, waterlogged, the roof had leaked. These 30 drawings, David figured out really quickly, looked a little bit like the mill. Suddenly, we had in our hands a set of documents that may be, and we're still using the word maybe, although less, that might actually represent a complete or a really complete mechanical drawing of what the original mill looked like. It's the Rosetta Stone. It was the way to see the whole, the whole design, the whole layout, including the interior, as the work of an architect uh, done at one time with one goal in mind, to get as much productivity out of this mill as possible. Uh, I, got my, I got a truth, truth. Complete transparency. I got a look at two drawings 10 years ago. David was kind of protective. He wasn't going to let these drawings out. Of the 30, I got a look at two. Last Sunday, I got the box for the very first time. Began to look through the box and found this drawing, which in spite of the questions that the first two drawings raised, now, after Monday, this Monday, for the first time, showed exciting evidence that it was the same shape cupola, many of the same shape parts of the building that you see today on the Mohawk. So am I prepared to say this is the Mohawk? I'm going to kind of hold off on that one. We're working on looking at numbers, we're measuring, we're comparing, we're looking at photographs. But boy, Monday night, about uh, 9.30 at night, when I hit that drawing, I was ready to sign up. Thank you, George. Okay. 
We're going to see some of his drawings as we go through. I have my camera, so all week when I would find drawings, I'd snap. George figured out that the Eureka Lake power source, they used Eureka Lake for the earlier mills. They tapped it, brought a water line out, used that to power a turbine. The turbine powered their stamp mills. George quickly figured out that the 40 stamp mill needed more power. He went to the upper falls of the Jameson, one of the most beautiful things in the park, and laid out a pipe that would follow along the edge of Eureka Peak and with just a bare descent to give the water gravity, that descent brought you to the Mohawk Mill. So he built and designed the water power for that mill. That's the drawing I found that shows what appears to be the turbine. Okay. And laid out, whoop, and laid this out with the, with the water power. There's the, the line of the water coming in. They laid out trams to the upper tunnels so that ore could be brought down. When water failed uh, in late summer, early fall, they added a steam plant to add a steam engine. And this combination became the classic view of the Mohawk Mill, uh, opened in 1878. Another round of applause is deserved for this guy, uh, William Johns. Okay, thanks, Darcy. There you go. Yay, there he is. The superintendent of the mill. Of the mill uh, uh, British uh, raised Cornwall, Cornish miner. Cornish miners are famous the world over for their mining. In fact, most of his miners, most of that 250 people, were Cornish, uh, united under the Methodist Church, living in uh, the town of Eureka Mills, uh, tight community, not much liquor, uh, but great miners. Uh, William Johns, is to his credit, was responsible for keeping these miners, one of the most hazardous jobs on the planet, working in this mill, working in the mines, uh, extracting ore. In 1878, uh, William Johns was given this, awarded this watch by London, the headquarters of the company, for having opened the Mohawk Mill and assembled this really amazing, complicated network of four mines, an original mill, uh, a town, Mo uh, Eureka Mills, and of course the new Mohawk Mill. What I didn't know was that this watch was two miles from where I lived in Oregon. The Johns family actually went down three generations and moved to Oregon. Uh, I began to meet them as I worked on the book and quickly learned that one of those relatives had the gold watch mentioned prominently in newspapers at the time, letting me know that if I just hung in there and kept talking to the Johns family, they'd lead me to the watch and I was able to photograph it. Another way of telling the story. Okay. <coughs> so the mill itself, uh, you're looking at 40 stamps in parallel. Really quickly, remember they figured out that they don't want to bring ore back up to the Mammoth Mill anymore, the one that's up on the hill. Uh, they began to dismantle the Mammoth and bring its stamps down to the Mohawk. Got a little crowded. Soon, instead of 40, there were 60 stamps in the Mohawk. Uh, if you can picture stamps going off 80 a minute. You've seen a stamp, there's one in the, in the mill upstairs. Uh, you can take a look at it, it's almost a thousand pounds per stamp. There's 60 of them. This, they're rotating on a cams that lift them and drop them. And these things fire off like cannons, 80 a minute, one cannon blast, once every, what, uh, 0.7 seconds? And by that time, you know, I mean, there's no OSHA. The, your ears have got to be just about shot in that environment. But that's the, that's the top of the stamp battery that you see these things. Ore was fed in, stamp, crushed the rock. Okay, thanks, Darcy. In this gadget, which is 10, 10 of these things vertically, these are the stamps. And they go up and down, crush the rock, and the rock is then crushed and mixed with water and mercury, liquid mercury, into pulp, which is what they called, and the pulp came down the center trough. How, we know that 40 stamps only, is all that you could hold across the mill. We walked it uh, on Thursday, and you can't get more than 40 stamps across that mill. 
20 more stamps came down from the mammoth. Where did they put them? The drawings may give us a clue. If you look, here's one side with the stamps with this line being this line. So you're, here's the stamps. Here's the sluice tray that feeds into the middle trough. So you're looking at this, you're looking at a map view of this with the pulp coming into this middle tray. Water, mercury, gold ore, ground to a pulp. These guys were added on the other side of the room to accommodate the other 20 stamps. Theory, I gotta get a little bit careful here. We get, I mean, if this is the Mohawk and we're believing it, then these extra uh, sluice pans would represent where they put the additional 20 stamps that they got from upstairs. But the drawings, George Woodward's drawings, begin to tell us the story of exactly how this mill was configured and what went inside of it and how it worked. Okay. I don't know who that guy is. We, we can give him a round of applause if you like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. Yay! We don't know you, but we love you. Right below, uh, the stamps, that, that sluice, remember, water, ore, crushed ore, mercury, would flow into concentrators. There are buckets of pulp. Th just think gold laden, right? I mean, you, I mean, kids would like to get their hands in it, but it's just full of gold. This was created by rotating that pulp in circular trays that turned and had steel balls inside that further ground, further isolated the gold. That was the concentrator room, all operated off uh, pulleys and belts from water power, okay? And finally, the last step was the plate room where the mercury water ore was run over copper plates in these long trays. The gold bearing part, the mercury with gold stuck to the copper plates and was later then removed by hand in the plate room. Okay? So we have some idea of what's going on in the mill. Again, the ensemble together, that's the plate room, a separate building actually. This part of the building with the eave on the roof, you can still see that today. That's the stamp gallery. That's where all these 60 stamps were, uh, were placed. And this is where the ore came in from the backside. All the trams that brought it down stored the ore in these bunkers. And we're sitting in the museum, which is uh, just off camera. Okay? Okay, and last but not least, uh, the back side of the mill, not photographed very often. The ore, the ore came down the hill. Eureka Mill is on the left. I'm sorry, Eureka Peak is on the left. Came across the tram. There was one last additional tunnel here uh, called the Eureka Tunnel. You can still see it today. The ore came across the tram to the top of the mill and was dumped into bunkers here. There's the other side of the stamp gallery. And let's see, this was about Wednesday night I found this, this week. Anything jump out at you? The top of the Mohawk, right? The peak of the roof, right there. That's the peak. And this assembly, coming back to your left, is this. It's the tram. All intact, showing exactly how it was built with a truss to support the weight of the ore cars that moved across it. I saw that and I, another kind of uh, uh, Indiana Jones moment, right? When you <laughs> kind of look at this and go, wow, I think we're onto something here. Uh, Woodward drew the contour of the hill that you can just see a little bit of it. I didn't photograph the entire sheet, but that's the hill going up. Okay. Uh, with this magic weapon, <laughs> the, the Mohawk Mill, uh, London was looking at the bottom line, right? London may not have appreciated all the stuff that was going on inside, but boy, did they appreciate what came out of this mill. This is the tunnel system inside, and you have to keep, this is in the museum. You have to keep in mind the complexity of this. Estimates vary from 20 to 60 miles of tunnel in Eureka, in Eureka Peak, not all of which were active at the same time, but at any given time, the tunnels that were active, okay, Darcy, thank you, produced this sheet. Uh, name of the tunnel on top, 
And here, so we kind of get grounded, here's the Eureka Tunnel. It's labeled. That's the tunnel that was right in back of the Mohawk. Other tunnels uh, don't mean as much to me. Here's the Mohawk about 600 feet in elevation up. Those trams that came down were pulling ore out of the Mohawk. 1882, uh, there's people working in the assay office here, volunteers who will tell this story better than I will. But each of these tunnels, how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight of these tunnels. Each day of uh, each day of the I'm sorry, each four times a month would be sampled with an ore sample, and that ore sample would be assayed, and the dollar value per ton would be reflected right there. Okay, and you see them, and they're different for different uh, tunnels. Uh, the low the low end is the Mohawk. The high end is the Eureka. How, so what this says basically, you're getting 20, on that date when they sampled, you're getting $26 of gold out of one ton of ore from the Eureka Tunnel. So how much does it cost to produce it? Okay, they kept, they kept numbers on everything. We've got records. It was $3.40 to mine it, to pull it out of the tunnel. It was 45 cents to mill it a ton. Put the two together, can we call it four dollars? I can't, I can't do the sense, but that's about four bucks to produce a ton of ore uh, in, in, to turn it into gold. So if you were in this column, yeah, let's see, you're getting four dollar gold out of the Mohawk. That isn't going to pay. You're going to shut your mind down. Over here in Eureka, you're going to do a lot better. London was at, had stock on public offering. At this date, in 1882, they were offering a 15% dividend on the Plumas Sharika mine. That is why. They were getting gold out of it like crazy. Okay. Okay, and then there was a decline. And then, oh, I'm sorry. Darcy, could you back up one slide? Does that mess things up? I, I, sorry, I, one more guy to introduce. My great-grandfather. Arthur McGregor, he ran the mill, I, uh, not for very long, but he ran it for about, I think, five years. And his job was to supervise everything that was going on inside the mill and make sure that the gold wasn't uh, high graded uh, instead of winding up in big ingots that Wells Fargo picked up and delivered. Okay. Wait, so, wait, wait. Yeah, wait, wait. Who else is in that picture? Oh, cool. Oh, thank you for asking. Okay, that's Grandpa Arthur. That's uh, great, uh, great Grandpa Arthur. That's great Grandma Lizzie. My Aunt Maggie, my Aunt Emma, and uh, Joseph. Uh, these two ladies babysat me when I was a kid, so they're kind of uh, family. Yeah. Thank you for asking. Great. Last hurrah, 1888. The mine wasn't doing as well in the 1880s. The money that we talked about coming out of those tunnels looked more like the Mohawk than it looked like the... Uh, um, Eureka Tunnel, uh, but in 1888 they hit one more, one more round of pay dirt in a tunnel called the Trizona Chute, and it was off the Mohawk, I, ironically, and it was mapped out on these maps. Stock, uh, the dividend on the stock had hit, I think, five percent, came back up briefly to 15 percent based on the Trizona Chute excitement. Lasted for two years, and then, sadly. Uh, it dropped. The crew, I, these guys, more, I, more than anybody, right, deserve the round of applause. The crew, the miners, me too. The miners, the mill guys, the, the hard rock miners that actually made this work risk their lives doing it. Some of them, a few of them lost their lives. Uh, William Johns, I've got to give him one more plug, was one of the few miners working in California who would keep a miner, an injured miner, on at half salary until he got well and could go back to work. That was unheard of in commercial mining in California at the time. But in the Plumas Eureka, under British ownership, it was in fact policy. And last but not least, in this era we're talking about, okay Darcy, uh, right next door, the town that sprung up, sprung up just about the time the Mohawk Mill did, Johnsville. 
uh, because the supply base to the lower end of the mine was so clear and so obvious. Instead of spending those miserable winters up uh, at uh, uh, Eureka Mills, you could spend a miserable winter in Johnsville. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just, you know, and come on, let's, it's all relative. Uh, but this town not only sprang up, it flourished, it became huge. Uh, oh, the house with the drawings? <laughs> 